my name is Chris Hummel. Um, tonight I'm going to be talking to you about uh, compiler design using JRuby targeting the JVM. Um, there's some metadata about me if you care to stalk me or just harass me in any way. Um, the, the, the essential way that we're going to do this is I, I, th this talk was sort of born out of a JRuby specific sort of uh, uh, user group. Um, and I can't really make assumptions on any Ruby knowledge on, on your guys' end, so I'm going to give you the world's fastest Ruby tutorial <coughs> and hopefully get you up to speed to the point that you could, you could run some JRuby on your own. Um, then I'm going to commit a bit of a, a public speaking anti-pattern and then talk about the actual background of this talk and where it came from. And then the meat and potatoes is the third section where we'll actually build a compiler from scratch. In, in pure JRuby. Um, so first, to kind of cover what Ruby itself is, um, I'm sure you've heard about it. And it is a, a dynamic, but strongly typed language. In other words, a variable could, at one point, um, reference an, a fixed num in int, then a string, then your own custom class. However, it is strongly typed, so you couldn't do something like multiply a string by an int. Um, it is object-oriented. Another of its most famous features is it is highly beta programmable. You can open classes up, add methods to them, remove methods from it, um, and change their definitions at runtime. Maybe not quite as beta programmable as this, but it's still um, relatively beta programmable um, to the point that you can you can even really hurt yourself and, and make your life miserable if necessary. Um, there are also multiple Ruby implementations. Uh, most notably is, is the most notable implementation is MRI. That's the, the the core written in C Ruby that everyone thinks of when they think of Ruby. Um, but there are also like Iron Ruby, which is Ruby in the .NET framework, Rubinius, which is high performance and LLVM uh, emitting, and JRuby, which is what we're going to use tonight, which is JRuby purely implemented in in the Java runtime. And it has a number of interesting functional features, like higher order functions and, and blocks, which are uh, um, incredibly concise and, and useful. Now, I'm going to start out by showing some very basic examples in just regular old So, what we have here um, should probably kind of make sense just by looking at it going to define a, a inventory item class, which we can consider an abstract class, a, a movie class, which extends an inventory item. And we define a constructor, and hopefully this inherited tax method will be able to produce a, a tax calculation. And that's just your basic, your absolute basic object orientation. So, And there you go, there's our, our tax calculation. And these are, like I said, these are very basic examples just to try to get an issue of this if you haven't seen it before. And here's where Ruby may begin to look kind of alien to you, um, where what we are defining here are hashes, kind of like your, your hash map in Java. And this is just the literal definition, keys of one and two to the fixed num integer values one and two. And that's an example of us adding to a key of three. So that's extracting data and puts it's sending it to standard out. And then we do the same thing with a hash that is this time keyed on symbols, which may um, would make a lot of sense to a list programmer. Uh, maybe not so much to a Java programmer, but they're sort of uh, constants. They are they're, they're only names. They they have no inherent values that they point to. Uh, and that's essentially the equivalent code using symbols. And here we're going to show you the literal definition of an array with one and two in it, and then we're going to append a three in, and then pop with the contents. And there we go. 
relatively, relatively simple, but the, the syntax can be a little, a little odd to a new Java program first. Now, JReview specifically is a highly compatible with regular C Ruby. For the most part, your average Ruby code can run in JRuby in the Java runtime with little to no modifications to it. It also has the ability to consume virtually any Java code that you might have lying around. So the idea being that for the most part, any, any work that you've done in Java, you could reuse, whether it's legacy or whether it's new. And one of the big reasons that JRuby has become popular in the Ruby community specifically is the concurrency situation. The concurrency situation in Ruby is pretty miserable. Um, MRI, the, the, uh, the, the basic ref reference implementation, kind of like Python, has a, a global interpreter lock, meaning that compute-wise, you can only capitalize one core at a time, which in, in this day and age is, is ridiculous. You can't get by with that. But with JRuby, you have you have Java threads and magically a, a wonderfully concurrent Java, or excuse me, wonderfully concurrent Ruby implementation. Uh, so even if nobody cares about running on the JVM or integrating with Java code, they still might like JRuby for that, that purpose. And here I have a very simple uh, example that, that shows some of the more Java specific features. As you can see up here, Java was included, which uh, just has given us in the runtime the ability to use use our own types or use Java types and then speak to the runtime. And then I just take relatively standard things like strings and, and doubles and two Java them, which returns me the actual the actual underlying Java type. And then I'm just going to uh, I'll put the class just so we can see there really is Java that's, that's, that's underneath there. And then I'm also going to require a jar, a stupid jar that I just put together that just has a little little domain object of a, a account with some, some silly credit and debit methods. But it's an example of the fact that you can just take arbitrary Java code that had no thought that it would be consumed by JRuby and it would still work. Um, and then afterwards I'm going to explain that business down there about the three nearly identically named methods. So as you can see, it thought that was a, a we did the two Java, we got a, a Java line double and a Java line screw. Um, and then we got our, our 3.10.25, which is numerically what we would have expected. But all of those methods were named differently. And the reason is, is JRuby tries to be very nice for us. And like if I show you the Java code for that account object, all that was ever defined in here was your, your, your typical uh, Pascal case Java code for that end balance. And JRuby was very nice and allowed us to use that Pascal case method name. But in Ruby, people typically use snake case, so it aliased that for us. And also did another alias with a, a missing get altogether. This is the idiomatic way to use getters and setters in, in Ruby, so it tries to cover all the bases. Now, the, 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 where this talk comes from, it was originally given by a guy named Ian Dees at JRubyConf in, in August of this year. The title of the talk was JRubyConf, Not Just for Hard-Headed Pragmatists Anymore. And the, the thinking, the reason that he gave the talk was that JRubyConf, by, by Ruby standards, had become relatively serious. Ruby has a reputation of being, you know, long-haired guys like myself, um, just people that are hackers, just trying to have fun. And specifically, uh, JRuby had become all about business. It was a, a incredibly practical, uh, practical situation, and you're you're always worrying about 
meeting customers' needs and, and basically making money. And that's wonderful, that's what we're here for, um, even Ruby programmers. But sometimes we need to learn new things. You don't necessarily always get it from the day job. And, and JRubyConf was beginning to reflect that, he thought. He thought that, and as you can see from these photos of JRubyConf, nobody there has any fun at all. And, like, there I am, like, I'm having no fun. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm so bored, I'm blurry. <laughs> that was, and, and also JRubyConf, there's also whiskey tasting, by the way, which was the But he wanted to at a talk that was a little more computer science -y, maybe just kind of programming for fun again, but also teach you things that you could use in your day job. So he put this talk together and produced a language called TNAD, which he defined as just enough of a fictional programming language to show how to write a compiler. And you could, you could find it on GitHub, and it's actually a, a terrific, terrific source for um, learning about the Java runtime to begin with, that you could actually throw JRuby out of the window, and it, it would still be a terrific introduction uh, to, to compiler design. Um, and that and, and so and was kind of JavaScript-y, uh, a relatively contemporary looking language. And if you're wondering where the, the name comes from, it's a literary allusion from Dr. Seuss. It's a, a letter in an alphabet in the book on Beyond Zero. And, and we're not going to build that though tonight. We're going to build a different language that is going to look like Lisp. Um, it's, in other words, it's going to be uh, a lot of parentheses and, and, and functional. We are going to write it in pure JRuby. We are going to write some Java solely for the purpose of reverse engineering, but there will be no, no Java necessary to make this work. It will live entirely in the Java runtime though, and what we build, what we compile, will be a Java class that will run in the JRE. Now what we're going to use to get there, obviously, is going to be JRuby. But we're also going to get a little bit of help from some hard work other people have done. Uh, there's a, a gem, which is basically a library, written by a guy called Casper Scheiss, called Parsons. Um, he essentially aids in, in writing parsers. And it, it it greatly simplifies the task of writing things like lexical scanners, kind of like your, your Lexbison situation. Um, and then we're also going to use ByteScript, which is a gem put together by Charles Nutter, who is the one of the, the principal developers of JRuby. And it is a, a, a basically just a, a JRuby DSL for emitting Java bytecode kind of like assembly mixed with, with Ruby. Um, and it's, it's, it would be hard to find a simpler way of, of writing Java white code by hand, or even programmatically for that matter. So we are going to, to set expectations, like we are going to write a compiler, it is going to produce a class file, and it is going to run, but it is going to be very limited. We're trying to do this roughly in the span of an hour. Um, so we're going to throw a couple very normal things out of the window that you would want out of a typical compiler or, or language in general. <coughs> we're not going to worry about conditions. It's not that they're hard, it's just that we're worried about time. Um, the only kind of local scoped variables we're going to have are going to be function parameters. And we aren't going to deal with OO. Um, however, what I think you'll see when we start to dissect and reverse engineer some Java code is that it would be very easy to write an arbitrary object-oriented language targeting the JVM because it's just built into the core of how the JVM works. Um, and if there, were, if there were to be a part two of this talk, I would probably do OO or I'd even add something like conditions or, or other basic, uh, basic things. And, and we're not going to provide any support for Using external Java code from our, our life, from our, our language, we're going to make it real nice and simple. We're just going to worry about things like adding numbers and whatnot. Okay, what it is going to do, like I said, is we're going to talk. You know, we're going to tackle some basic math. We're we're going to basically just worry about adding some numbers. We are going to provide the ability to define and execute our own functions, and we are going to have some basic standard output. 
and it's going to suck. Like it is going to be a pretty crappy language, but that's okay because that's what we're we're not we're not setting the bar very high here. We're just trying to get the, the basic things done, and we're going to consider that a, a, a feature rather than a bug. It's just going to be sort of, sort of lame. So we're going to call this language somewhere. <laughs> The components within the language are, are going to be basic atoms. Um, they're the smallest components that you think you could possibly imagine for, for your language. Things like identifiers, the names of variables, the names of functions, literals, um, such as the string hello world or you know, integers one, two, three, four, five. And lists, meaning that we're going to look like lists, we're going to need lists, um, a grouping of opening atoms and the ability to use those lists themselves to be function definitions and calls. So that's more or less what we're going to attempt to compile. The, the idea behind that it is it is darn close to your regular old list. Uh, some things to kind of take note of is that the plus sign on the left there, there's no difference between operators and functions, in this case, in, in list. Printing something is the same as adding something. Uh, while it might look a little strange at first, it actually serves us very well in that we don't need different handling between doing math than we do for function execution. So it kind of simplifies our job. And within the actual code we're going to build, there's going to be three basic parts. Now, one of which is the parser, which is going to take suckling source code and build some pretty ugly and unusable data structures from it. And those data structures are then going to pass through a transmogrifier, which will produce an AST, an abstract syntax tree, a syntax tree. That syntax tree is going to be beautiful in that it's going to be data structures that we would want to use. We would want to traverse that tree to produce compiled outputs. And those are that, that tree is going to, con to contain classes that we define that might have uh, some behavior to them, like the ability to emit their own Java bytecode. And then at the, the end is the compiler, which his job is to traverse that tree emit that bytecode, make sure it makes it to a Java class file, and call it a day. So, step one. The very first piece of code we're going to look at. This is, this is not yet, by any stretch, a, a program we would want to execute when we are done building. We just want to parse this. We're going to define things in parentheses as lists, and we want to be able to deal with things like white space around atom numbers. <coughs> and we just want to take that in and, and produce some data structures that we can work with. And that would ultimately, this would not yet serve a purpose as, as far as compiling would go, but it's going to get us started. This is the beginning of our parser. And this is where parselet comes into play. What we are defining here is a parser. It extends parser to parser. What it is is a bunch of rules. All of these rules indicate what is done when certain situations are, are, occur. And it gives names to these rules. We are poking through our code. We need to do that. We need to these rules sort of reference each other. So there's this space question mark, and the space question mark references space. And space matches a regular expression on one character. If there is, if there is a, a space character, any number of them, then it matches. And you'll notice that while you could write a regex that would handle things like cardinality and repetition, we generally want to avoid that. And, and we're shooting for single character matching alone and dealing with repetition, we're going to leave 
that parcel. Um, and we're just saying here that if you find a parenthesis, we're just going to ignore space around it. That's what the maybe says. Um, and obviously, we're also going to want to extract numbers. Now, as you see with this as guy, what that is indicating is that it's going to give it a name that we can latch on to. We're going to be able to pull those numbers out when we parse. And we're going to say that a list, it's a very poor definition of a list, but it's going to work for now. It's going to at least parse the code that we just showed you, which is a number surrounded by parentheses and a program is a basically a list of lists. And down here at the very bottom, we are going to instantiate that parser and feed in a file that we specify from the command line. If all goes as planned. Essentially, what happened is it spit out. We said we wanted to extract things named a number. It pulled every number out of that source file that we found. That's a start. That's 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 going to get us doing. So as we move into step three, we're going to start talking about expressions. We're going to group those atoms into something useful. So we're going to change our, our example code up a little bit, where we're going to want to make sure that this <coughs> works, the list of one item works. And then we are going to want the space delimited, white space delimited list um, on, on the second line. So we're hoping for a list of one and a list of two things, ultimately. And to make that happen, we're not really going to have to change a whole heck of a lot. We defined this rule called expression, which is at the moment it can only deal with numbers, but a number and some arbitrary length delimitation of other numbers, and that's going to make an expression. And we're going to say that a list has an expression in it. And the actual The actual output more or less reflects that, where we have one list, one number, second list with two numbers. Long way from a program, but we're making progress. So now we're going to start to, to, to pull in some, uh, some components that you need to make something actually work, such as identifiers, things that are going to be variable names, function names, and those are going to be formalized into what the concept of an atom is. And then we're going to want to make sure that lists can contain lists. So. Now this actually is the first code we've seen that will be a, a functional program. So we hope what that is basically indicating, what would indicate is, is print the result of adding two and three. And like I said, note that that, that, that plus is a, a pure function execution. So let me, uh, having some. Anything can be an identifier. 
uh, basically anything that doesn't start with a space. And that's going to include our, our plus sign, our print line, that kind of thing. And we're going to say that it is an identifier, and we can just go from there. And we're going to sort of change the definition of, of expression. Like I said, to say that, that you don't just contain you don't just contain numbers, you can also contain atoms, which are, are more useful. So we're looking a little better here, where our list now starts out with an identifier, print line, which is going to be a function name we're going to run. And then another list, which is that function called to add the numbers, add two and three. And then in step four is when we're going to begin to think about strings, which is very simple. That's just uh, another literal that we're going to handle. <coughs> so we're going to add to our, our potential listed atoms a, a string. And that is by far the ugliest rule you could possibly imagine seeing. And it really isn't all that important to just kind of look at that rocket and understand it. Um, but suffice it to say that what, that what that means is we're going to wrap arbitrary stuff between double quotes. And this is all an attempt at making it escapable. So you could, you could backslash a, a single quote and have it contain a string. Um, might be a little much for the purpose of this demonstration. But it does kind of indicate that you could do some relatively complex parsing uh, using parcel. And that is all we've added, is just this notion of a string. And when we run that, that's what we see, where we have that first command, which we left unchanged, and added that one to the bottom, which looks like print line our string. Now, concept of vectors. Here is a place where we are absolutely going to punt. Um, this is also the code we are going to compile. When this works, we're going to consider this done. Um, but we are, well, not when we parse it, when we actually execute or, or admit the bytecode for this, we consider it done. What this vector is going to mean is just that, that list of the parameters right there. To really be a vector, you have to be indexable. But we're going to sort of omit that and, and just and just deal with that bracket uh, list for the purpose of having some nice syntax. So we can easily say that that is the argument list for the function of food. And also to kind of think about it in a list fashion, that define, where we're defining function, is a function call in its own right. Defining a function is a function in a list. And essentially, all we really had to do was copy the role for list and, or excuse me, for list and name it vector and give us something else to pull it out as. Then we added the notion of brackets which are, they operate just like parentheses. They're just something to surround and, and indicate that you are descending into a, a inner list. And then when we run that, we get 
pretty much what you would expect. We have two auger lists, and that def fun, right after the identifier of its function name, that it is going to be defining as a vector of its arguments. Um, and that's really all there is to that. Like now? Step six. Step six. What's it? So, um, in, in this step, is we're going to begin to uh, build, actually build the ASD past that ugly, that ugly structure of stuff through the transmog transmogrifier and get a, a structure of objects which we're going to want to decorate with some behaviors and actually traverse to compile. And we're going to stick with our, our same code from last time. And then, oops, add, a, add one of these guys down here. So, and I'm also keeping this all in one Ruby file, which is a not an idiomatic thing to do. Um, I'm doing it largely because it kind of amused me to build a compiler in one single source file. Um, but that would, uh, that's not a recommended practice by any stretch. Um, but we're going to define this, this parser transform. And it kind of looks like the parser does. The difference is, rather than defining matching conditions of these blocks, these are, these, this is actual um, execution that's going to occur. Every time it runs across a symbol, a scalar type, a single number, not a, not a list of them, but an array of them, then do this. So we're going to take the, the number that we got from parcelage is going to be some crazily parcel token object and convert it to an actual Ruby fixed num. Same thing with string. We are going to produce a Ruby string from that. If we were not using a made of programmable language, we actually would probably want to rack those in, in some kind of, of, of object and get our own behaviors to, um, which, which you'll actually see why in a moment. But then when we see an identifier we come across. An identifier, we're going to wrap that up into this identifier class, which we have defined right up here. It's just going to be a silly class that contains just the name for now. Um, and then we have these function called nArg lists. You'll see that this guy, the, the vector, is, is known as matching a sequence, just a list of things. The fun call has this subtree directive where it can, it can match a, a, a deep tree of elements. That is, is not exactly, using the subtree thing is, is sort of beyond the scope of this talk, but you probably should not do that. Um, you can use combinations of symbols and sequences to make it, to, to get where you need to go, because you can really shoot yourself in the foot with this and start to match other rules, and it's, it's pretty insane. But it'll work for the purpose of this talk. And we're just going to shove what's ever inside of those into a couple of list classes that we defined up there. And to see their, their super class, they just have a list of items. That's all they are. Now, in our actual execution now, we are going to take that initial result for parsing, pass that into our transmogrifier, and print the output, which should look similar, uh, but a little, um, a little more understandable and usable. So what we have here is something that actually almost begins to dictate the behavior. We see an actual fun call, actual function call, <coughs> to a function named defun, with a first argument of foo, and then it has an arg list. These are things, these now are operating under a language that the compiler is going to understand, and that we understand. Um, and down below you can see something similar with println being the fun call that's occurring and what it is doing. You see a string result is and then the back call 
of the fluid. So that was the, the entire abstract syntax tree built in, in one step. Now, we are going to take a break from this mess and actually look into Java a little bit more. Um, so. What we're going to do Java code and then look at its bytecode. Now, this looks a little strange in that you would never in, in real life use three different calls to standard out to do this. But what we're actually trying to do is rather than write code like a human, we're trying to write code like the compiler would here. Um, maybe not like a good compiler, but one that would suck anyway. Um, this is sort of the equivalent, it looks darn close to the equivalent of our, our, our suckling code that we've defined. It's going to print the result is, call a function foo with a couple of parameters, and then move on to the next line. So the JDK gives us some nice tools for peering into that bytecode. So if we compile that, and then we're going to run a program which spat the bytecode out. There's actually one line that you can't see where it actually has public class, class name, which is interesting in that it tells you that this really understands the object orientation. So what's in there is a constructor that we'll never use and we're going to ignore that. We're not even going to define one of those ourselves, maybe a compilation. <coughs> but then foo becomes a little more interesting. We can see that it's a it knows it's a static function that takes two integer arguments. This bytecode essentially says push argument zero, local variable zero, onto the stack. The same thing with the second one, and then call iAd. What iAd does is pops those two, adds them, and pushes the result. And then this returns. If you've ever seen like x86 assembly language, this is this is far more stack based and it, it's far simpler and, and easier to understand I, I think um, but that's essentially what's going on here as far as the JVM is concerned now it gets a little hairier and uglier when we start to peer into our main but we can see that we have this get static call to system out print stream what that is doing is pushing a static reference to the print stream class onto the stack. Then LDC takes the string, result is, pushes that onto the stack. Then invoke virtual calls print. Then get static, does the same thing to print stream again. We're going to push our six and our nine onto the stack that invokes static foo, what this is doing, this is actually calling our foo function. Now, the reason that this can use invoke static is that it's in the same class. When you're calling outside of the class, you have to use invoke virtual, um, which kind of complicates the code a tad. But then you get down to the end, we're just going to print that result. And then at the very end, that invoke virtual, we just call print ln, <coughs> no arguments, just get to the next line. Um, and, and that is exactly what the bytecode looks like under the hood. Our task at this point is pretty simple. We just have to take that tree that we have and translate it into this. That is all, that, that's all. Once you've done that, you've built a compiler. And we are, are really almost there. So. And we're, we're going to, before we get back into uh, back into our own compiler that we're working on, we're going to take a, a small look at some byte script. So what this is, 
So now we're going to take a, a small look at some byte script. Now what this is going to look like is going to look like a very strange hybrid between JVM bytecode and Ruby. And that's pretty much because that's exactly what it is. Um, Charles Nutter put byte script together so he could write the language Mira, so he could make programming languages that, that target the JVM. And as you can see, we include ourselves up some byte script. We start a file builder, and then we just call these Ruby functions, like public class, indicating that we are making a class that is going to be called 8. This will produce 8.class. We are going to create a public stack method named foo, and oops, it is going to return an int. <coughs> it is going <coughs> it is going to accept two ints as arguments. That should look more or less familiar compared to that last slide, where we're going to push the first argument onto the stack, the second one onto the stack, and then call i add. And i return is going to get us out of there, returning the integer value. And I'm going to kind of leave some of the fluff up. We're not, we're not going to worry about printing the result is for the purpose of this demonstration. But what we're going to do here is is, is push a print stream static reference onto the stack, just like you saw in that raw bytecode. And it did some BI pushes in that bytecode we saw, which was pushing bytes. But we, we can, it's just as legal to say LDC, which is like push whatever the heck you want onto the stack. It, it's, it's sized reasonably, two words. And then call invoke static foo. And then the result of that foo is going to leave that result sitting on the stack, the, the hopefully the value 15, the addition of six and nine. So we're going to call invoke virtual, and that should invoke virtual on the print line method of print stream, and that should produce a, that should produce the result 15. So if we run that JRuby code, we should have a Java class named 8. Sure enough, we do. And if we look inside it, it actually looks just kind of like a more concise version of what we looked at before. We have a class named 8. We did not specify a default constructor, which is fine. Um, we have foo, we have main. That looks like it would run and produce 15. So, if we run 8, that's what it did. So we just put together from Ruby by way of direct Java bytecode, we have produced a class with zero Java. Now, at that point, we are ready to get into the compiler, where we are going to teach our types to emit themselves to Java bytecode. Now, we are we're going to continue to operate on this example here, which is our, our ultimately finished finished suckling program. <coughs> the first pass of the compiler, all we're going to worry about is teaching the basic atoms how to emit themselves, how to push themselves onto the stack. So it's going to produce something that runs, but it's going to do absolutely nothing useful. It's going to push result is six and nine, hopefully. And how we're going to get there is this. We're going to leave the parsing and transformation largely alone but we're going to start to work on this, this compile function here, where we start up a file builder, we're going to start to define a class, and as a parameter, you can specify the name of the class. We're going to make a very broad assumption here in that we are only ever producing a class that is meant to be executed. So it gets a main, uh, no matter what. Obviously, if you're trying to build a real compiler, you would, you would not do that. Um, or a, a publicly usable compiler anyway. And within that main, we are going to go through the AST and just 
tell everything in it to emit itself. This emit is something that we are going to, to define up top. I'll show you that in a second. And the last thing that it's going to do is to take that bytecode and write it up to disk. And we, uh, down here, will basically call that, that compile on the result. Now, that emit, where that gets interesting, is that we've now given every atom, and actually everything in our AST now, has this notion of an emit, what it can do. It's going to do something to some class, some method of that class, and probably have some set of arguments hanging around that it has to worry about. Anything that's a list, like a, a function call, or, um, well, primarily a function call, it's going to have some number of things in it, each of which it's just going to want to tell, put yourself on the stack, or do whatever it is else that you do. And what it comes down to these identifiers is when we actually kind of get into some meta programming. So this module, emittable, what this is doing is, is it's just a, a logical grouping of functions. We're just going to put one method in named emit. It knows it's going to be operating on some class, some method of some class, with some amount of arguments hanging around. And it is just going to take whatever this is. It, this code doesn't know am I a string, am I an int. It doesn't know that. But it's going to make the assumption you can push that on the stack. And then we're going to mix that in to fix num and string. Now, this this would look very, very common to a Ruby programmer, but perhaps not to a, a Java programmer, in that this fix num is, is that's the equivalent of int. We're not defining a new class, we're opening a class and injecting new methods into it, um, just because it's convenient. Um, it's called monkey patching. And then we're going to do the same to string. That is, is the, the typical Ruby string not a class of our own design. What does LDC refer to? Method.LDC Okay, good question. So what that actually is, what we passed in to emit is this and main. What main is, is the function main. So whenever emit occurs, it is going to emit that bytecode operation into whatever function it received. So what this is doing, saying the LDC, which is push whatever it is onto the stack in main. So basically that LDC is going to push a, a result is a six and a nine onto the stack. That's basically the, uh, the class and, and method context. <coughs> And this is actually the second to the last bit. So if you want run nine Ruby on prog, and you'll actually see where those LDCs come out now, we will have something that is absolutely not usable, but what we have done is we have compiled something. We've compiled something wrong, but we've compiled something. That, that LDC pushed the string, result is. Now, it was smart and converted our LDCs to buy pushes, to push bytes. So just think of those as our, our LDC, our LDC calls, to six and nine. So basically, this would run and do absolutely nothing. And we can demonstrate that it at least doesn't crash. And it did nothing. So we'll have to trust you on that. What's that? We'll have to trust you on that. Yeah, like it, 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 the, the, the TDD mentality. <laughs> This is really where it gets gets kind of hairy, but it's also where the actual 
the actual magic happens, so to speak. Um, the, the actual compile, the actual compile function we have is going to stay the same. We're just going to traverse the tree and tell everything in that tree to emit itself. Now, if you recall, where we had lists of things, these these lists are going to begin to have a behavior, an emitting behavior. So, if we look at our, I'm just to kind of show you what guy this is. This is our. Let's see here. So, our fun call essentially is going to be the workhorse of the. <clears throat> the entire compiling process. And this is a bit messy. This this single fun call class is going to know how to do things like emit addition, emit the print line, emit your own functions, and you probably would not do that if you were really putting something serious together. But it's going to work for now. So down in this so Whenever this class is brought into life, it's a list, so it gets a list of items. What it's going to do is take the very first item in its list and the head of the list and, and save that away in a data member called main, meaning that is the function name that I am going to be executing. And the tail of the list is just parameters. It's whatever is left. And when that function call is emitted, it's going to inspect that name and, and, and determine what it's supposed to do at that point. If it sees a def on, it knows it's going to have to define a function. It's going to have to emit an actual method into the byte code. If it sees a plus sign, excuse me, it knows it's going to have to push some list of integers and then call iad, uh, maybe a couple of times. If it sees print line, it's going to have to push a, a, a relatively ugly uh, print stream on, onto the stack with a static reference and then, and then execute it. And then otherwise, it's going to make a broad assumption that if it can't figure out from that list what it's going to do, it's probably trying to execute a function that you defined. So it's just going to do that by default. You'll notice that all this knows how to do is addition. This, this doesn't even know how to do subtraction, but it would be trivial to add those kind of things in the future. So to kind of look through some of these, we'll start with one of the easier ones first, which is, I'll add one. So in op-add, we know what class we're in. We know what method we're in. So we are going to iterate everything else that's in that list. So in, in our example code, it was a 6 and a 9. So this is going to go through a 6 and a 9. Or it could be variable names, x and y. And it could be x, y, and z. There could be any number of them. So it is going to traverse that list until it exhausts it. After, and it is going to essentially emit those. If it comes across a 9, it's going to say, just push yourself onto the stack. Now, this is the part that it, it might not be, be obvious by uh, looking at it from the, the course of this talk, but I would encourage you to uh, maybe check the, the source out on GitHub to try to grok it, because it, there's almost no way to kind of um, push all that, that context to you in, in a short talk. But what it's going to be doing here is if it sees an X, figure out what number of its local argument it is, and then try to tell it to push it on the stack. Suffice it to say, all it's doing is pushing stuff, and after every two, call i add. And that will get you basic addition. You could follow that same pattern and do i sum or i mall or whatever you want. They're all JPM opcodes. Now, defun is probably the, the, the most abstract and, and kind of diff most difficult to understand in terms of its Ruby anyway. Um, but what it's going to do 
we kind of start in the middle on this one, is reach into whatever our class is. We don't care about our method context, whatever class we're building is what we're concerned with. And we're going to make a static method. <coughs> Keep in mind, this only knows how to make static methods at this point. It has, it has no idea how to use this method. <coughs> we know what our name is. We're going to make another broad assumption, which is all functions return integers. And then we're going to make more broad assumptions in that all arguments are integers. And, and for the most part, this is only, this is, this, this is only useful. This, this whole language at the moment is only useful on integers with the exception we're going to teach another print string, and that's about it. And kind of what we do to feed into this is just take a list of all of our arguments and build up this, this Java args array. And that, that class int, what actually what that actually is, is like a you know Java lang integer dot class. It's just a, an, an array of types. And this over here, that that uh, um, asterisk turns it into turns an array into a, a parameter array. The ultimate point is we reach into the class and we define a static method. And if you can remember from looking at the bytecode, the actual definition of the method is kind of ingrained within the runtime. It's pretty pretty easy to do. And the the, the assumption, like I said. It's making the broad assumption that everything, every function you define will always return an int. Um, and then we're going to have our, our print line, which is um, more or less like we saw in, in the decompile or the, the uh, reverse engineered example we had, where we're going to whatever method we're in, if we're in, in make the main function or if we're in foo or wherever, we are going to append some bytecode to there. We're going to start by getting a static reference to print screen and ultimately invoke it with what's ever on the stack. Now I am going to make kind of a, a special case here where, like I mentioned, we are at least going to bother to teach print screen how to print out strings. So what I'm going to kind of do is punt and if whatever I'm printing out into there was a fixed num, I'll, I'll know it's an int. Otherwise, I'm just going to say object and just kind of hope it works, which in this case, it's going to get a string, so it will work. Um, and like I mentioned, invoke virtual is going to uh, actually execute that guy. And fun call is just calling our own stuff, where we are going to invoke static, we are going to call, in, in our case, foo of our own class, passing the parameters in. And like I said, this, this process is um, it is hard to express in a slide. It's probably also kind of hard to, to try to understand as a slide. But I think you could probably get the intuition of taking that tree, that syntax tree, and any process that you would use to take that tree and to spit up bytecode is a compiler. So. I'm sure you can imagine your own algorithms doing that. Um, and that is essentially the only modifications that we have made here. Um, and just to kind of put a bow on it, what we did was parse a file, convert it to an AST to kind of make it nice and tidy, and then shove it into our compiler function and hopefully it's going to produce a file of, of whatever class we want and actually put it on disk. And to kind of review, <coughs> you've seen this at this point uh, five or six times, but this is our code we're coming out. We have defined our own function named foo which accepts parameters x and y, it is going to return the addition of those two parameters. It is going to print the string result is, and then the result of calling foo 
this. On our yeah. Sorry. All right. So then we're going to print the string result is, and then execute our defined function two of six and nine. So assuming that my math is correct and the code is correct, we should see the result is 15 if all goes as planned. arguments onto the stack calls IAG, IAD and exits. Then we also have a, a main, which looks like it, it, it pushes its static reference to print stream, pushes result is, then it calls print stream, so that should print result is. And then basically the same thing again, where it's going to print the result of foo with six and nine pushed in as arguments. And then at the very end, it is going to print a, a carriage return and exit. So that, to me, it looks like a reasonable job of bytecode to do what we're trying to do. And sure enough, it did. So that is effectively, at this point, a fully functional compiler that really only knows how to add and print, and that's about it. Um, but it's, it's, it's useful in that you could start there and, and get pretty much anywhere you need to be. You could start with that and produce closure if you care to. Um, and basically we got there using pure Ruby and pure JVM. And that is, I think you could argue that JVM would be like the, one of the ideal places you might want code to live. And if you were a language designer, uh, it, it certainly doesn't hurt to have a, a, a wonderful runtime to kind of deal with a lot of the crap for you, such as um, um, once you're a Java class, well, then you can just be used by any Java application in any container, such as, uh, say, Tomcat, for example. Um, now, so what we've learned, then, is, is how to use Parslet to pull apart some source code how to use byte, byte script to emit some Java bytecode, and, and, and hopefully some, some JVM internals. I'm not, I'm not sure how much exposure anyone around here has had to, uh, to, to Java bytecode and how the JVM works, but it's a, it can only be useful. It certainly can't make you a worse Java programmer. Um, and, and that is basically it. Um, so thank you guys for your time. Any questions? So you mentioned uh, a little while ago you're contrasting the Java bytecode with x86 bytecode. You said the Java bytecode was more stack based. Yes. What is x86? Like, what's the difference between them? So, um, no, I haven't written any x86 bytecode or uh, excuse me assembly in a while. But um, an example would be something like. And that's one operation. That's add the number one to whatever happened to be in the register AX. If you had an like ARM assembly language, something to the effect of, uh, I forget the register your name, but you could do something like that. So it's register based instead of stack based? Sure, it's sure. Primary right. right. And in the case of, the, 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 as, as I understand it, like LLVM and, and the .NET framework are the same way in that you, know, you do a something to the effect anyway of I load two, three, I add. So it's uh, you know a a somewhat more verbose setup from a, a a emitter's point of view, 
but it, it, it makes it getting at return values and whatnot. It, it's very predictable, and it, it's a really if you're a, a language implementer, it, it would be hard to find a, a nicer situation. Anything else? Yeah. Yes. Are you using these techniques for real stuff? Absolutely not. Um, like I said, the uh, no, I, I, okay, for for my own um, my own edification, I've done some language design. But until I saw ENDs originally give this talk, the thought of targeting the JVM never crossed my mind. Um, but after seeing the talk and, and giving the talk, um, I, I certainly intend to do so at some point. Uh, it just hasn't happened yet. But you know, it's like I said, part of the, the idea behind the talk wasn't necessarily to be practical. It was to try to have fun and learn some things. Um, and I, I, I can sure say that it taught me. Do you know if any of the current JVM languages and closure and Revere and Closure are using Parslet and ByteScript? So I don't know about Parslet, but there's a language called Mira. Okay. Which Mira is, Charles Nutter wrote Mira who is the guy that wrote ByteScript. I believe he wrote ByteScript for Mira, and, and then realized, well, this is awesome, we're going to segment it out into its own, own library. Um, the attempt at Mira is to wrap sort of the Ruby syntax around Java, so it is, it is statically typed. It feels like Java, it just kind of looks like Ruby. And for all I know, Parslet may be involved, but I'm not certain. So I'm curious uh, how securable this is, or it may be relevant to, to it, but like, do you underwrite, for example, some kind of browser language the in browser execution? Is there, is it, does that have any bearing on how, how secure you can make it, or is it more just make sure you can design your compiler right? Right, well, I mean, it's a combination of making sure you, you design your compiler right in that. Um, it, it is relatively easy to, to emit crashing bytecode, um, but one of the advantages that you have living in the JVM is you are as secure as it is, and it's its own sandbox, hopefully. Um, so, like in short, I really don't know the ramification, the security ramifications, but you, you kind of take what you're given in your own time. Anything else? You ever um, <coughs> used any of the pure Java bytecode manipulation libraries? I have, while actually putting this talk together, I, I looked at a couple. Um, I had, I just wondered how, because that seems, that seems like an awesome DSL for, well, writing, for writing bytecode, and it's right. way better than. Like a, com right, like a, a comparison of at least, right. um, like a, a number that I've seen, they, they just look more verbose, which isn't, which isn't a, a surprise, and the, the, the idea behind Ruby is not, necessarily to be readable as much as it is to be concise. Um, and, and when you're, you're, you're dealing with bytecode, I mean, it's not going to be readable anyway, right? <laughs> you know, so it, it kind of fits that bill well. But yeah, like, like um, I, I guess, you know, Handler would come in more on like, the, the parsing side. Yeah, parsing. Uh, and, and, and the only stuff I did with Handler was with the uh, Clips plugin. It was, it was a lot better. Right. So. Parslet, like, it's um, the, the, the pro parslet propaganda is often making fun. You know, uh, I've heard. Uh, like, in, in, in truth, like, uh, from a performance, like, if you, you cared about the speed of the parsing, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't expect parslet to be wonderful, but it sure is concise. You know? Yeah. So. That's a good question. I, I don't know the answer to that. That is a. Um, you could. I mean, you can check it online if it's possible. I don't. I don't know the answer, but um, uh, it, it's, it's certainly worth looking into. Those. So, 
sorry. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys.